Fantastic. So let's get started. Andrew Feuchsel, NASA's chief astronaut. Welcome to the channel and thank you very much for joining me today. I'm really thrilled to have you here and I really appreciate you taking the time to speak to me. Thank you, Matt. It's uh, my pleasure to be here and to share my experiences. And yeah, just recently uh, actually left NASA, uh, stepped down as the acting chief of the astronaut office. And it was, uh, it was an honor to serve and uh, I certainly wish my colleagues the best as they go forward with their uh, with the Artemis program to return humans to the surface of the moon. <laughs> Fantastic. I am going to get to that question a little bit later, but perhaps for those that don't know you, can we start maybe with connecting the dots and can you tell me how someone went to community college, did restoration and being a craftsman of you know, antique automobiles and then turning into an astronaut, going into space and spending over 255 days or exactly 255 days and a couple of hours in space. Um, can you connect some dots and tell us a little bit of a story behind that? Thanks, Matt. Great question about uh, how it all started. Uh, tough to say, I think uh, as an astronaut, I often look back on my career and try to understand how the pieces fit together. I can tell you that uh, before I became an astronaut and started this career, I had no idea how I was going to make, uh, you know, make, make this possible. And, but looking back, I can see how it's all linked. I did start in community college uh, here in the, in the US and uh, worked as an auto restoration specialist as a certified mechanic. Uh, and during that time attended community college and was interested in science and automotive design. Uh, I choose to follow the uh, science route and attended Purdue University, studied geology and geophysics. And at that time I started thinking about planetary resources and exploration of space. Um, I also knew at the time that Purdue had graduated uh, a number, a large proportion of the U.S. astronaut corps. And so that seemed like a good fit for me. It was also a place where uh, I had some family members attend uh, dating back into the early 1900s as graduates of Purdue University. So that was something that led me there. And from Purdue, went to Canada to uh, to seek a PhD in uh, seismology and underground mining and still had my sights set on NASA. Um, that experience at uh, Queen's University and receiving a PhD in seismology led me to Exxon Mobil Corporation, which is headquartered in Houston. So when I found myself back in Houston uh, with some uh, in uh, experience in industry, both in mining and uh, oil and gas exploration, and realizing that I had the um, the credentials at that time to be competitive in the astronaut selection process. That's when I applied and that's when, uh, uh luck, uh, uh, you know, lady luck was favorable to me and allowed me to join the astronaut program in the year 2000. So 23 years later, I'm walking out the other side and have really been uh, honored with a, a really fantastic career, three space flights, uh, acting chief of the office at the end and, uh, couldn't have, uh, couldn't have made up a better story. So I'm just, I don't know how it all worked out, but somehow it did. That's incredible. I mean, speaking to an astronaut is probably a greater experience than meeting actually Hollywood star because the only so few, I, I think I've read recently, there are only 39 astronauts now, active ones, where there used to be 150, something like this, more or less. Yeah, yeah more or less. Yeah, when I, when I joined the Corps, I think we had close to 180 or 200 active astronauts. Now, if you include the newest class of graduates, I think we're closer to 50 active astronauts who are eligible for space flight assignments, but many of those folks are off doing one thing or the other. So it does, it does reduce our numbers significantly compared to 20 years ago. And so talking about those three space flights and spending 255 days there, can you share maybe your experience what did you learn going into space? Is there anything you could tell or shed a little bit more light about going there and seeing the world from the top, which probably no one is going to see for the next 50 years unless the space flights are going to be commercialized <laughs> and affordable? Yeah, it's a good question. So I'll, I'll just provide a slight correction. It's actually 226 days, I think, that I've gotten space. Okay, uh, 197 of those. Yeah, it's close. Who's counting, right? But uh, and it's not the most number of days of space. I've got colleagues, of course, who have flown either for a year total on the ISS, uh, you know, a single one-year mission, or 
uh, individuals who have flown two or three uh, visits to the International Space Station for six months at a time. So by no means do I have the most hours of any astronaut in space. Um, but I have had the experience of uh, visiting the Hubble Space Telescope on my first mission, and then uh, the last flight of Space Shuttle Endeavor uh, for the second mission, and then, of course, a chance to fly with the Russians on their Soyuz rocket uh, to spend almost seven months on ISS uh, to serve as commander of the International Space Station. So um, some, some good variability, um, a lot of different experiences as an astronaut. I, re I remember the the first rocket launch uh, on the Hubble uh, for the Hubble mission on Atlantis, STS-125, and thinking to myself that you know nothing prepared me ever for a ride on a rocket, especially a space shuttle. Uh, it's the most dynamic, aggressive, violent uh, experience that you can sort of imagine in your mind, like a really bumpy roller coaster, although on steroids. And uh, you know, one thing that you're sure of is that you've left the planet. And all you can hope is that you know that the rocket uh, has ha it knows where it's headed uh, to get you to space safely. And then to see Earth that first time from space is something that's hard to put into words and describe the feelings and the experience of being there. Uh, for me, I felt a lot of uh, vulnerability for the planet and some recognition that humans if we had, if we all had the chance to recognize our planet in space, in the vast darkness of space, I think that we would work harder to be together as a species and understand, you know, where we fit into this, into this universe and, and uh, how we treat each other and, and the ways in which we treat our own planet um, and trying to work harder at not only cooperating together, but cooperating with our environment so that we can ensure our existence and and the continuation of the human species. So, you know, that's a challenge emotionally and psychologically for I think every astronaut is how do they how do we share those stories and those experiences to um, make it relatable to everybody else. And I think we all share a desire and a hope that uh, humans will continue to have greater access to space uh, to join in that. Uh, community of recognition and hopefulness to uh, continue to cooperate and live together and and do things that uh, allow us all to to uh, to prosper and and continue on. Okay, wonderful. Thank you for sharing this. Really itchy question, but I have to ask if uh, since I have the opportunity, will there be another mission going to the moon? And yes, how soon do you think it's going to happen? Or if not, why? Uh, so I think now we're talking about Artemis and NASA's plan uh, to work with international partners to return humans to the moon for the first time since 1972. I absolutely 100% believe that we will see humans on the moon uh, within the, for sure within the next decade, hopefully much shorter, even five or four or five years. Uh, we'll definitely see a flight to the moon uh, if you know the Artemis 2 mission, the next scheduled flight uh, should go off in the next couple of years, and then that's going to set the stage for a return to the moon with a, a new lander that's under contract uh, with SpaceX for the first human landing in uh, since 1972. And that's going to set the stage to continue the momentum that we see right now in the space community and the human space exploration community to return humans to the surface. Um, so uh, I'm very confident that we're going to see that happen. And that's partly based on not only the intentions of the federal government, but also the agreements that they have uh, achieved with international partners and in alignment with those agreements, which are the Artemis Accords that talk about the use of outer space. Um, we've seen considerable investment uh, by private companies and actually movement and action on their part to build spaceflight hardware, to certify that hardware, to create launch opportunities, to bring hardware to the surface of the moon in support of humans. So. Uh, I am 100% certain that you will see humans walking on the surface of the moon again. Uh, and this time uh, we're going to be there uh, to stay in a sustainable way uh, for the foreseeable future. Okay. And is there a reason we had such a long period between when we first landed on the moon and now going or planning the next mission? Why such a long gap? Why no one 
actually was it a financial reason or was there a different reason or more about preparation getting the technology right being ready and you know ready to rock yeah well you know we had the technology then it's very different than the technology now uh the rockets themselves are very similar they're chemical uh, rockets that uh, that use hydrogen and oxygen primarily, um, sometimes uh, methane uh, to fuel those rockets, but in a sense, they would call chemical rockets. So the rockets themselves, the propulsion systems are very similar, but the technology, the navigation, the guidance, the control systems, the electronics, all of those things have changed our capability um, uh, to execute those missions have, has increased dramatically in the last few decades. The reason there's been such a gap is because our objectives changed. At that time, we were racing uh, what we called the first space race, trying to beat the Russians to the surface of the moon. We achieved that objective. Uh, and because of that, we really didn't have a long-term plan or a longer-term plan for sustainability. Um, and so NASA and the United States government changed focus from uh, trips to the moon to uh, orbital platforms around our own planet with the space shuttle and ultimately building the space station that allowed us to do work uh, located in what we call low Earth orbits uh, within, you know, two to 300 miles of the surface of the Earth. And that uh, consumed enormous resources on the federal government's part and really all that all of the resources that could be allocated by uh, the federal government and Congress um, to be able to achieve those goals. So uh, if you think about the people and the money to finance those missions, we really couldn't afford to do low earth orbit operations and lunar missions at the same time. So our focus changed. The intent was to um, enable platforms for science and research and technology in low earth orbit. And that's what we've been doing uh, since the 70s and, and the mid 70s. That started with uh, the Russians uh, putting up the Mir space station, ultimately after a few other of their uh, lesser duration uh, space stations. And then the US and Russia followed with the joint program including international partners, uh, to have the ISS, uh, that, that uh, science platform in space, that laboratory, since uh, 1998, when the first module was launched. Now we're getting to the point where we're reaching the end of uh, space station service life, so 2030 or shortly thereafter. Um, and because of the technology and the cooperation with private companies, we're now seeing investments in space, investments in low Earth orbit operations, and the intent to go back to the surface of the moon, that's what's bringing these other companies along. Um, new space station platforms are being proposed. So the federal government now, having not had the resources or people uh, for the last 50 or 60 years to, to continue to develop lunar ops, now is able to focus again with the space station ending uh, on back to the surface of the moon with the people and the resources that we've used all along to fill that gap. And so that's why you saw a gap because our objectives changed, but now we're, we're able to take those resources that we focused on low Earth orbit and focus them back on the surface of the, of the moon. Okay, great. Thank you for clarifying this for all those that don't believe we're going to do it or make it or why there is a gap. How do you manage a professional life with your personal life being an astronaut? It must be super busy and it's not a day-to-day -day job like anyone else would do. So. Can you, can you shed some light maybe how, how to balance this, being, being in a role that is so responsible and exciting at the same time? I'd say there are challenges. Um, I think astronauts, having become an astronaut, you know, once, once that transition occurs, of course, it, it changes your life forever. Um, it is difficult to separate you know, my personal life or identity, it's sort of becoming an astronaut becomes your identity, at least as a federal government and professional astronaut. And it's not something that I believe ever, you know, leaves your identity. And that can be a challenge because it, um, it can affect the way uh, people speak to you, the way people treat you, the expectations that people have. Uh, you are never not an astronaut uh, once you become one. And so that does that does create some challenges, but it also creates immense opportunities. And the the biggest and most important um, and most impactful to me has been the ability to inspire um, people of all ages um, and, and all, in all parts of the world. And that has been probably the most rewarding of all, even in spite of um, 
the opportunities I've had to fly in space and the experiences that I've that I've had, the aspect and the, uh, of sharing those experiences and inspiring people who listen to the stories and think about the things that they could do or the places they could physically go um, or the goals they could achieve, you know, that has had the biggest impact on me personally. And I, I think the greatest reward of everything is that I've seen others pursue goals and dreams and objectives and, and sort of use me as the motivation um, to get there. And that's humbling and amazing and, and probably been the most, the most significant portion of the, you know, this, this identity as an astronaut is, is helping others in their quest for, for uh, achieving their goals. Okay. That's, that's wonderful. So what advice would you give younger people starting out in a career or, you know, picking something they want to do in life? Maybe as an astronaut, if that's possible, any tips, but maybe in general, if they want to pursue their dreams of choosing a career path, what would be your top tip? I think, I think what I, well, what I like to tell people is to try to pursue those things that you enjoy and not to pursue those things that you think are necessarily a requirement to become something or do something, because if you don't, and, and then you can use that as an indication as well as regarding whether the thing you're trying to achieve is actually the right thing, because you really should enjoy your work. Uh, I think the most important thing about work and a career and uh, deciding how your life is going to uh, proceed is that you want to feel rewarded for the things that you do. And that won't always come in the form of of money or salary or, or benefits. It comes in the, in the personal satisfaction that you're doing the thing that you enjoy. And by doing the thing you enjoy, that will allow you to be good at it and successful because you won't think of it as work necessarily. You'll think of it as your life. Um, and I think that's really important. Now, it's not always achievable. And, and, and I don't mean to be trivial in saying, hey, you know, just do the thing that you like to do, because that that doesn't always allow you to make a living. But I think it's important to pursue that and have that in the back of your mind that the things you're doing are a means to the end of of finding the place where you really feel strongly and passionate about the, the things that, you know, the work that you do. And that should enable success uh, and a high quality of life and high satisfaction in, in, in the things that you're pursuing. Okay, thank you for, for sharing this. I can imagine you are very well disciplined and trained to deal in difficult situations. I mean, going into space, you have to be very focused to do certain things. What advice would you give to younger people in those days dealing with difficult situations and what tip or how to handle those on a, on a daily basis in whatever scenarios they are available? Uh, well, I'm still learning myself uh, how to manage those difficult situations. I think I've been looking back, reflecting on my career to to try to think about those. Uh, how how do I how do I quantify those uh, character traits or that behavior to tell others, you know, or help others achieve those same objectives? And I think, um, you know, what's been important for me as an astronaut in terms of the uh, the actual mechanical things that we do, but maybe not mechanical is probably not the right word, but actual response to emergencies, for example, is that we train. We, we train over and over again, and we build so much familiarity with response to off-nominal situations that we, we essentially nominalize them. We, we take emergency situations and we work on them so many times and analyze the ways that we should respond that when they occur, they're no longer really emergencies. They're just a condition that is presented to you that requires a specific response in order to hopefully achieve a positive outcome. And I think it's the same in our lives. If we're faced with scenarios that over and over again cause us to react in a way that's negative or not um, the most productive, what we what's really important is to rehearse those events um, put yourself in those situations, get exposure to those, those activities that, that create maybe a negative response or not a, a positive outcome and learn how to nominalize or normalize them so that you can deal with them 
uh, rationally, calmly, and effectively uh, with, with the desired outcome that you want. And so, you know, practice makes perfect or practice makes better. Um, that's, that's true. And that's not something that I made up, right? We, we adopt our training regime from um, past astronaut training experiences and professional, uh, professional athletes, uh, military, right? These are, these are organizations, you know, high risk, high reward, high performing organizations. They gain their proficiency and their professionalism by rehearsing over and over and over again. So I think that's a key component to um, doing well and reacting to scenarios is to, um, to practice and expose yourself to them as much as you can without risking your life, of course, in the meantime. So simulations are better than the real thing. So practicing constantly to become better and more efficient in a particular thing. But what's one habit that stuck with you throughout your life and had a positive impact? Is there anything else? You could add to it maybe one positive habit you're you try to keep on top of it on a daily basis to keep you going keep you ticking and do the things you are uh, facing on a daily basis yeah i think the one thing that has helped me the most in life is managing my expectations of outcomes and um i i hope that's not a that's not a negative way to look at things but basically uh if i have if i don't have unusual or unreasonable expectations about the outcome of the scenario, it's difficult to be disappointed in the outcome of the scenario. So uh, for me, that's been a big thing. And it's something that one of my colleagues, my first pilot uh, on STS-125, uh, uh, pilot Greg Johnson, uh, Ray J. Johnson, uh, used to tell me all the time, hey, Drew, it's really important to manage your expectations, because if you don't, you know, you're just going to be disappointed. And so that's one of the one of the one of the tools I use, I guess I would say to sort of deal with daily life and the challenges that come along, um, trying to stay calm, trying to react um, in, in a positive way um, to all scenarios and see if you can find the solutions by uh, managing uh, what you think you're going to get out okay. of it. I've seen on YouTube you played some music in space. Do you get actually time maybe to read books as well? Or are you too busy? And if yes, is there a book that you could recommend someone to read and you've recently read? Um, so. Playing music, yeah, that's something I did in space and, uh, of course, uh, enjoyed that very much. It was a great way to pass the time. Um, and, and, of course, there's a, a history there of playing music with uh, a band called Max Q, which is the astronaut band. And, and we've had some great successes over the decades, uh, you know, entertaining audiences locally and, and across the U.S. Um, and music was, was really a, a great... Uh, a great way to sort of escape in space and, and to be to have the opportunity to play play guitar while looking at the earth um, is left an indelible uh, impression on, on my life. Um, reading was not something I did as much in space. Uh, I spent my off time uh, actually watching uh, motorsport races, uh, both uh, Formula One, MotoGP and IndyCar. And, and I made a project uh, for myself to take photographs of all of the race tracks in the 2018 season while I was in space and post them on my social media. So for folks interested uh, on my social media site, Astro Foistel on, on, uh, on Instagram, if you scroll back to 2018, you'll see a racetrack posted just about every Friday before the, uh, the race took place. And that was my way to pass time was to uh, get photos of the tracks and uh, post something before the race weekend to uh, bring all the fans along and get, get, uh, um, certain demographic of people that maybe were only motorsports fans to, to think about space and space exploration and vice versa to get the space fans to see what I was interested in. Maybe, maybe look at, uh, you know, the sort of enter entertainment value and competitive value of uh, motorsports racing and the excitement that I feel about it. So that's kind of, the, those are the things I did to pass my time in the way that I found uh, the things I found interesting in space. Okay. I'm cautious of time. I know you need to be the next meeting. So I'm going to wrap things up and ask a final question. Could you share a piece of wisdom that you want to pass to the younger generations and that they can take something away from this interview or in general, from your experience, life experiences, anything you would want to say at the end? Yes, Matt, thanks. That's, um, you know, it's hard to say. I, I, I've been I've been trying to analyze that more recently as well, and as my career has progressed, you know, think about ways in which I can help uh, others who are you know moving through life and and thinking about what the future holds. 
I guess I would say, you know, the cliche that anything is possible. I believe that's true. I believe that humans have great capability when it comes to achieving their goals and, and finding their finding objectives that are meaningful for them. And that's, I think, what's most important is doing meaningful things, finding ways to, um, you know, support your community, your local community, the world community, and finding ways to make a difference. And you can make a, you can make a difference in many ways. You don't have to be an astronaut. You don't have to be a doctor. You don't have to be a lawyer. You can be a tradesperson, you know, just about anything and everything that we all do to find passion in that work. And if it's something that you love, um, I think it's worth pursuing. And that's that's all I would recommend, sort of echoing what I said previously, which is pursue the things um, that capture your heart and that will allow you to be successful and uh, and to contribute back. Wonderful. Andrew, I wanted really to thank you very much for taking the time to speak to me today for sharing all the stories and clarifying certain things. Definitely the part with the moon landing and next mission to the moon. Yeah, thank you so much. It will definitely be a big deal for me and probably one off. I will never have that possibility probably to speak to an astronaut again. Okay, Matt, sounds good. Listen, I really enjoyed talking to you. Uh, thanks for the opportunity and, uh, you know, reach out anytime. I, I appreciate your persistence. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, Persistence is the thing that pays off. So uh, keep up the good work and best of luck with all your uh, your future endeavors. Thank you so much.